Hi folks, I'm Janae Sivas, the Carb Addiction Mom, and today I have with me a couple of special guests. The Carb Addiction Doc, whom you all know very well, and we also have the Carb Addiction Kid. <laughs> so this is Rian Sivas, our baby boy, and obviously this is an update video uh, for all of you. So I think where we last left off was talking about sort of the later stages of my pregnancy. So we just want to give you an update on where things stand today, as you can sort of surmise for yourself. <laughs> yeah, you know, folks, it's interesting. Um, as the carb addiction doc, as we've gone through this keto pregnancy, I've received a lot of questions from pregnant uh, moms or um, moms thinking about getting pregnant, lactating moms, early childhood moms. Should I, shouldn't I? And the interesting thing is this. For those of you that know the Professor Tim Noakes story, the very first thing, the, the, the tweet that got him into trouble in the first place was that he recommended or he agreed that it was okay for a breastfeeding mom to eat a keto diet. And that just threw the South African Dietitian Organization into uproar and it ended up in a two-year lawsuit. He was tried twice and found innocent twice. You bring your evidence... I'll bring my evidence, let's compare notes. They couldn't bring much evidence. He brought a pile of evidence and was exonerated twice. And, and really, the, the reality of his trial was as awful it was, as it was for Tim. The reality of his trial is it basically said this. All of the evidence points to the fact that a ketogenic diet is the healthiest diet for a pregnant, for a lactating, for a breastfeeding mom, and for a newborn baby, at least through the first 1,000 year years of its life, as the most precious thing that makes us human as, it brains, as its brain develops. Now, this child that you see over here, he's not superhuman, he's not perfect, he's not, I think he's pretty gorgeous, I think he's pretty cool, but you know what he is? He's the most important thing that you'll that we could have done with our child. He's normal. He's normal in a world where fewer and fewer of us are healthy and normal. And we don't want him to be perfect. You know, the opposite of good of too little is just enough. And we've done all we can, we're going to do all we can to make sure that he is enough. So to answer the specific questions that some pregnant moms have, some wannabe moms, some lactating moms, I'm going to let Janae talk to you, now it's the N of one, about the outcomes of her keto experiment through this pregnancy. Yeah, so I think the last time we left off was probably around 34, 35 weeks. Um, really, I, and I posted about this, so for those of you who follow me on Instagram at Carb Addiction Mom, you'll know, um, but I felt really great throughout the entire pregnancy, literally, the right up until the day I gave birth, and even through the birth, I felt great. So again, I recommend for everyone that this really is the best way to eat and to, you know, be a pregnant woman. Um, I never had the first sign of swelling. Uh, I never had a pain, a discomfort, an ache. Um, you know, I never had a food craving. Uh, I had a little bit of aversion early on, of course, during the nausea period, but that was really it. So the pregnancy was absolutely flawless. Um, why don't you, why don't you just speak to kind of what a general eating day looked like for you? Yeah. What the do's and don'ts were of eating? Sure. So I always have a glass of, and I'm still doing this today as I'm breastfeeding, um, a glass of whole milk with heavy cream in it in the morning. Um, and then somewhere around noon, one o'clock, you know, I would have my first meal of the day, which would typically be something like eggs and cheese or eggs and bacon, or maybe some salmon lox and cream cheese, something to that effect. Um, or I'd have pepperoni and cheese slices, something that was fairly carnivorous, actually. And then our second meal of the day, or my second meal of the day, would be his first meal of the day, um, would be around 5 or 6 p.m. And that would be something that would usually, I would typically have a vegetable in it, maybe a slice of avocado or a slice of tomato, something like that. Um, in addition to Those our, are both fruits, by the way. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> or cucumbers or asparagus or you know, spinach, something to that effect. And then um, we would have, you know, our typical fatty meat, whether that be 
a fish, um, a ribeye steak. Sometimes I would have filet, but I would put butter on it um, and really fat fortify that meal. And of course, lots of salt. So that's really it. And Say that again. Say it again. Lots of salt. <laughs> lots of salt. Lots of salt. Yeah. About five grams of salt per day. Yeah. That was very and in important. fact, just a little shout out. What was the other thing that you drank from time to time? Yeah, I was also drinking the red, the Redmond uh, Real Salt electrolyte drink. It's called Relight. Um, and I would typically drink that throughout the day. I would sip on that throughout the day, um, which also has a lot of salt in it. So that was helpful as well. And she used that as a bridge to manage her too mad through the day. Yep, exactly. So that's really what a typical eating day would look like for me. And by the end of the pregnancy, I had gained 21 pounds total. Um, and we delivered. That's just a little under 10 kilograms for those of you that are international. And um, then we had a C section at 39 weeks, and that's when we got this little bundle of joy. And it was an elective planned C section. Um, we had a high risk pregnancy, so it was an elective planned C section. I'm going to come back to that in a second. But you know what's also interesting, and Janae and I haven't even discussed this, but it's as I've been doing talks, what was interesting is. As the baby gets bigger in your belly, it affects, it pushes up on your bowels, it squashes your bowels. And I know from other pregnant women that I've dealt, that, that I've worked with, um, those eating the standard American diet or a very high fiber diet find that their bowels are just awful. They struggle with constipation, they struggle with uh, even diarrhea, pooping. Why? And Janae was pretty much carnivore. She was omni carnivore, carnivore in capital letters supplement a little bit with vegetables but whether they happened or not was really not a big deal more just for the fun of it than for the nutritional value um why don't you speak to how your bowels worked yeah they worked very well i never had an issue i didn't have either of the extremes no diarrhea no constipation so it was really kind of regular in that regard and never caused me any problems so um, i think rob always says for those of you who follow him that he's never seen a constipated lion so i guess that's our <laughs> testament to the fact that that well, was they're all, really they're all dead because they exploded behind a thorn bush <laughs> somewhere uh, <laughs> um, what supplements and what additives did you take we've talked about the salt which is the key thing the electrolytes we we, we took them because you wanted them not because we thought they were necessary right um, and we certainly support them and we love the um uh, Redmond salt, uh, real salt uh, electrolyte mix. But what other things did you take to supplement your diet? I just had, every day I had my prenatal vitamin, and then I had krill oil, so the fish oil, to get the extra fat in. And it was a 3 and 6 omega fatty acids that are critical. Those are the only essential fats, and that's essential for what makes us human, which is our brain. Um, and time will tell, but... Um, it is our scientific knowledge that pushed us to do that because brain development requires massive amounts of fat. 65% of what's in here is fat. About 30% of all the cell membranes in this head of, of our child is made of cholesterol. And if you don't consume enough cholesterol, consume enough saturated fat and mixed fats, especially the 3 and 6 omega fatty acids in a 1 to 2, 1 to 3 ratio, um, it's going to affect uh, myelination of the brain. It's going to affect brain development. But the other part also is imprinting. And, and I think as the carb addiction doc, not only did Janae not consume carbohydrates, and how did you test that you weren't, that, that you were not, I mean, we know what you're putting in your mouth, but talk about the keto mojo a little bit. Yeah, so I would regularly, routinely, if I had my CGM on, I would obviously use that as my, as my guide, but if I didn't have my CGM on, um, I would use the Keto Mojo to test both my glucose and my ketones. And so my glucose would run anywhere from about 65 to 85 generally, and my ketones were usually above two. Mm -hmm. So I knew that they I were was... quite high actually. I was surprised at how high your ketones were. I would have predicted between 0.5 and two, but you were typically between two and three. Yeah. And yet not an acidosis at all. We checked her blood. No ketoacidosis, so don't worry about that. If the sugars are low and you're, and you're in ketosis, very healthy, very effective. And that was tested uh, quite often. But also, Janae wore a CGM quite a few times and always had low blood sugars. The problem with the CGM is you still have to test your ketone separately. We didn't have a continuous ketone monitor. So um, that is not only perfectly safe, but I would argue that it is recommended 
for a pregnant mother to be in ketosis. Zero risk. Zero risk. I'm going to say it one more time. Zero risk of gestational diabetes. And gestational diabetes, especially if it occurs before the 20th week, has a sevenfold increased risk of fetal death. This is a precious baby, folks. Sevenfold increased risk of fetal death during pregnancy. The other thing that our OB talked about is this epidemic of hypertension and preeclampsia, which causes early uh, deliveries, prematurity, um, blood pressure problems, are kind of unrecognized by the general population. I knew of preeclampsia, I know of the HELP syndrome, I know of hypertension. I didn't consider that to be as common and as severe as our OB, who was an excellent technical surgeon. Uh, Dr. Sam Lederman um, here in West Palm Beach. I can recommend him to anybody. Technically a superb surgeon. And I know a thing or two about surgery. Just <laughs> absolutely brilliant in terms of how I did the surgery. We'll get to that in a little bit. But um, he talked a lot about this epidemic of hypertension and preeclampsia that also causes a ton of prematurity and a ton of, ton of harm to moms and some maternal deaths as well as fetal deaths. Why don't you speak to, and we have a blood pressure and saturation monitor in our uh, bedroom. It's kind of quirky, but uh, O2 sat monitors um, and, and blood pressure monitors in our bedroom. Why don't you speak a little bit to what your blood pressure and, things were, and heart rates were running at? Yeah, so my blood pressure throughout the pregnancy was really within normal limits. Um, and normal. No, it's not normal. Not normal. Not can be normal. defined in various ways if you've seen some of Rob's posts. But um, it was 100 over 60 at the most was really where I was. Um, typically maybe 90 over 58, something like that. And my oxygen saturation levels were always 98, 99. And my heart rate was right around 60 most of the time. So. And didn't you get brain fog? Did your brain work properly? Did you not have seizures? And did your cardiologist not? No, she doesn't have a cardiologist. <laughs> <laughs> recommend that you need a pacemaker right away. Right. Yeah. Um, no brain fog, no, uh, quite tired. That's part of the pregnancy, especially in the latter part. You slept more than you sleep most days. So you slept a little bit longer. But other than that, no brain fog. You worked until the night, until about seven or eight hours <laughs> before her C section. Yeah. She was on uh, um, phone calls and, and working like a dog. Yeah. So never let up, never let up. Yep. Didn't even sit with her feet up. She uh, sat with her feet down. I kept on, Janelle, raise your legs, you're going to get swollen. <laughs> never really swelled her legs uh, until after the delivery. Uh, happened for a little bit after the delivery. But just an amazing, an amazing pregnancy. And really no issues. The movement of the baby's heart rate, everything else that we monitored, absolutely fine. The other, the other key thing, when you look at fetal growth parameters... Um, we look at the head circumference, we look at the length of the baby, he's slapping in the middle of those, um, of those metrics. But the interesting thing is, and this is something that's happened recently, he is technically a little underweight. But the reality is not that he's underweight for his gestational age. All the other kids on the standard American diet are fatter than they should be. Fatter, more floppy, less developed than he is. He's got a ton of brown fat, but no white fat. None of that pork fat that I used to have as an obese person. I've lost 98 of those pounds. That was obesity weight that came from carbohydrates. He didn't have that. And, and the beauty is that he was developed in ketosis and was born into ketosis. There's one other thing while we're talking about the pregnancy that I do want to mention, and that's the concept of imprinting. And imprinting is that your baby, before it's born, develops certain affinities and certain strategies that are imprinted on his or her brain about how to resolve emotional stress and tension. So when mom becomes stressed, there's a certain hormonal milieu that gets released. Your cortisol levels go up, your adrenaline levels go up. When you're sad, uh, a certain hormonal milieu happens. And how you respond to that hormonal milieu is imprinted on the kid. And then down the road, when they experience something similar, it triggers that imprinting and they have a much higher degree of attraction to that method of emotional management. So one of the key, key things that we focus on, not only carbohydrates from a, from a developmental perspective, a brain and a body developmental perspective, but carbohydrates are a highly addictive drug that we consume in excess. 
to manage our emotional tension, our anxiety, our stress, our depression, our anger, our fear, our sadness, our boredom, which is an emotion, and our pleasure. But Janae didn't do that. She didn't use drugs, no carbohydrates, no alcohol, not even caffeine very often. No substances to dissipate that emotional tension. Instead, what did you do? Um, a lot of various things. So um, I'm really big for those of you who follow me um, on human connection. So always having conversations with friends, colleagues from work who are dear friends, my family, my husband, um, a lot of uh, games of cribbage, which, you know, um, from our time together as well, that that's one of the main things we do in the evenings after dinner, instead of having dessert. Um, a lot of song and dance. We would often sing songs, dance around the living room, um, go for walks together, physical activity, and even creative arts. I'm not the most artistic person in the world, and I don't have a great singing voice either, but we still do those things. And, um, you know, things like getting the nursery ready and, and picking out different paint colors and framing pictures and those sorts of things were also a big part of um, what I did to sort of relieve some of the emotional tension, if there was any. And what did you do with his um, older relative in the house? Oh, <laughs> I thought you meant you. <laughs> <laughs> I'm the ancient relative. <laughs> and we would take Tabo for lots of walks. Tabo's so. our dog. He's our big dog, 130-pound yeah. Ridgeback. And he would, Janae would take, he, that dog was so spoiled <laughs> by Janae being home during the COVID crisis and taking him for walks two or three times a day. The amazing thing is the dog got so used to the timing of the walks that he would come and put his snout in her lap as she was working to say, come on, mom, let's go. Time for, time for my walk. So physical activity, um, uh, creative arts, playing and dancing and, and playing games and just having fun being creative, uh, singing. Um, Janae is a very spiritual person, a lot of spiritual time. And then what Janae has taught me more in our relationship than anything else is empathetic human connection. Now, a lot of you are laughing behind, the, uh, behind your screens. They're saying, you and empathy don't belong in the same dictionary, let alone anything else. No, I, it's amazing how much more empathetic I've become, despite my ranting and raving on some of these videos. And, and that comes from Janae, putting myself in the shoes of others and looking back at how my words affect them and being so careful, because I, I was never cognizant of that. So Janae derives a lot of pleasure, and she's so good at empathetic human connection. And ultimately, as human beings, we have to stand together as clans, as groups, as people helping each other, putting our differences aside to move forward. We have to have fun and laugh at ourselves and play games and draw and paint and sing. Spirituality, meditation and spirituality are critically important as drivers of effective emotion management, as is physical activity. Blowing off steam, de-stressing, activating those endorphins with physical activity. It doesn't have to be a 10-mile run, but being dragged around the block a few times by a 130-pound rich bag is pretty <laughs> darn demanding. <laughs> and, um, you know, just even carrying a bag of his poop, that's weightlifting right there. That's powerlifting <laughs> so, after some of his meals. So the point is that Janae, from an imprinting perspective, hopefully has imprinted this man with things that made her happy rather than drugs that made her high. And that's an important distinction. Be happy, don't get high, and you imprint this little guy with an authoritative, effective way of developing strategies and techniques to manage his emotional needs in an effort-based, effective way, rather than a drug-consuming, instant gratification way that causes harm.